All right. I'm not an attorney. I'm not an accountant. Thank God. I'm giving advice based on my experience and successes. Okay? I do not claim that anything in this presentation is legal advice, estate advice, or tax advice. And please feel free to check with your accountant or your attorney before using any of these techniques for the rest of my life. Amen. <laughs> okay. So uh, tonight I want to talk to you about the eight golden rules of real estate. There could be more, but eight sounds like a good number, you know? And I'm, I'm hoping that you guys listen to this so that you know these rules because they're important. The first one's pretty basic. You make money when you buy. I hope you believe that. I'm going to show you a couple of examples tonight of how you make money when you buy. Right? The negotiation process, man, it's, it's crucial. You're, you, you worked with your archaic 1976 CRM, and someone actually called you back. It's a miracle, right? And now, you've got a first thing you do with that person is you're going to book an appointment. You're going to make an arrangement to go see them. One of the lines that I often use that works pretty good is I say, hey, I'm going to be in your area tomorrow around 2 o'clock. Does that work for you? Get the conversation going. If they, if they believe you, that you're going to be in the area at 2 o'clock, they're going to probably, if they're nice people, they're going to try to accommodate you, right? And it could be for real that they have something else going on. But that line has been very successful for me. So once I figure out something that works, oh, I run with it forever, okay? I'll be using that line 20 years from now, I can guarantee you, right? So, um, you know... Just as an example, if, if somebody has a home that's worth 240 grand and you could somehow buy it for 165,000, you're making 75 grand right there, okay? Now a lot of you probably think, well, that, that, that can't be done. That's never going to happen. I'm going to show you two deals tonight that made way more than 75 grand, okay? And uh, so you absolutely can do this. And I'm going to show you the pictures of the properties and explain you how I did it. Okay? So, when if you did do a deal like that, like you bought a house for uh, a $240,000 home that you bought for one hundred you are not going to have $75,000 in cash in your hands. But your net worth just went up by $75,000. If your real estate portfolio all of a sudden now has 75,000 in this particular property that you just bought for 165 grand, you have the money, okay? It's there. Could you go to a bank and refi and take some of that cash out if you needed it? Yeah, sure you could, but probably having 75 grand in equity may or may not be enough for you to get a refi done. But uh, if, if you needed the money that badly, you probably could get some of it out. Okay, so um, it takes a long time to save $75,000 if you're working a job, okay, because if you're, if you're not out buying real estate, which is pretty much all I focus on, I wake up every day and I'm just looking for the next deal, another deal, and uh, I don't want to say anything nice about Larry tonight, but um, I do have a list of about 15 addresses that I write down on a pad. Of, of, I was recently in Florida, and I found a property there, and I started, uh, went out at 6 o'clock in the morning to get some coffee. I started walking around the guy's property, and I started sending him some cards, and i very much like to buy his property. It looks like it's totally wasted. It's got vines and garbage and cars parked on the lawn in Siesta Key where there's like million dollar homes all around it. I mean, the, the cheapest house anywhere around it is maybe $750,000. And this guy's sitting very close to the beach. And uh, I'm, I'm bombarding him with mail right now, hopefully trying to get some kind of deal with him. We'll see how that goes. Not just that one house, but, but anything that's on my current list, right? 
um, is, is what I'm always looking at. So you just got to keep looking. Keep looking all the time. You're always looking to find great deals. That's it. It's the easiest way to build up your portfolio and make lots of money. And I love this business. And that's my favorite thing to do is it, I'm always focused on when I wake up every day, I, typically, I, I haven't had a job in 25 years. So I sort of get up and think, well, what the hell can I do today that's going to make me the most money? And the answer to that question is almost always the same answer. Go find some house to buy, right? And, and, and even if it's just cold calling people to buy mobile home parks in Florida or cold calling people to buy houses in Pennsylvania, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I just want to try to find something to buy, something to buy that I could put together and feel good about it, okay? So another rule is always buy from a motivated seller. So this would be, this would be someone who isn't motivated. You might say, hey, wh why are you selling this house? And he says, um, no way, I love this property and I never want to move, but if you pay me enough, I might sell it. Well, that's obviously he's not motivated. OK, but this next line I've heard many times when you go into depressed neighborhoods or tough neighborhoods in Philadelphia, or like North Philadelphia or in those areas and the houses are messed up, like trees had fallen on the back of the house and the back wall of the house is is going to have to be rebuilt or you're walking in the living room and you can see the sun through the roof because there is no roof in a certain part of the section of the house. This kind of happens all the time. And those people are v very common that those people might say something like, I just want to be done with this house, right? And a lot of times it isn't some major hole in the wall or thing like that. A lot of times what the problem is, they've been living there for a long time. They can't afford to re repair the house. They just can't renovate the house, okay? And the way things are going, since they can't renovate it, they're forced to live in a, <clears throat> a circumstance where the house is almost unlivable. And that's not a good scenario for most people. And sometimes the best solution for people like that is to possibly buy their house. Put some actual money in their pocket so they can go rent a more appropriate place to live in and have a year or two to live in that apartment while they figure out how they're going to buy their next house or if they even want to buy another house, right? So this is the way you could help people out. So the first thing I do if I'm at somebody's house, the first thing I do is show up on time. Uh, if you're driving like an I buy houses car, that helps because they know that it's you, you're there. And I have business cards that have pictures of me in front of my I buy houses store with the I buy houses car, with the I buy houses trailer and all these things and I give them my business card and I tell them listen what I want to do I just want to take a quick walk around the outside of the house they can come with me if they want to or they sometimes they don't want to come and I'll walk around the outside of the house and all I'm thinking about is how much money is it going to cost to bring this house up to a uh, a better shape okay how much money do how much money do I think this house needs it's all I'm thinking about I'm not going to have a conversation with the sellers and get into specifics about, oh, your roof needs to be fixed and that's going to cost this much. I don't do that. I just walk around the house. I estimate repairs at the outside of the house and I'm, I'm using a high number. The number that I'm going to tell the seller is going to be a higher than uh, probably what it would cost me. Okay. All right. So then I, I come in the house and I say, I'd like to do a quick tour of the house. And they often will follow you inside the house, but they usually don't on the outside. But whatever they do, it doesn't matter to me. Because all I'm doing is walking through the house and trying to figure out what's going to cost to fix this house. Okay? So let's just say that uh, in my mind, the construction cost is going to be 75 grand. All right? If we go back to the example of the last house, $240,000. And if I can make a justified case that this house might need 75 grand, if it's got brick pointing issues outside, if the windows are old as hell, if you can't even open the windows, if the, 
if there's uh, siding that's fallen off the building or asbestos siding, you, you know, having some knowledge about uh, real estate and what things cost is really good to have. And you can learn that from going to Lowe's or Home Depot and walking around the stores and familiarizing yourself with what things cost. Another thing you can do is Home Depot and Lowe's both have software programs now. You could get an iPod or an I, uh, iPad, one of those iPads, and you can run like Lowe's program on there. And you can go around and count. If you wanted to get really specific, you, this is what a construction guy would do. He would go around and count all the windows. He'd, count, he'd measure or approximate how much drywall would be required. And he'd come up with a, an accurate number. And the more and more you use a program like that, the better you'll get at it, the better your estimates will be. But I like to pad my numbers a little bit so that, so that I've got a cushion in there, right? And I have some kind of explanation of why I'm offering him a lower price, all right? So um, if you hear somebody say, I just want to be done with this house, you, you, they are telling you, they are telling you, bid lower. Don't, if you're, if you're not embarrassed by the price that you're going to offer them, then you're not, you're not right. You're not thinking right, okay? You have to... You have to take a shot at it. You can always raise your price. If they want to, so it, it, funny thing that happens with, with these people is if you ask them, hey, well, you know, how did you come up with, uh, I, you know, what do you think this house is worth? And they usually tell you they don't know, they're not sure. And, you know, if they make you tell the price first, all of a sudden now they're an expert, okay? <laughs> that happens a lot, okay? So don't feel guilty about what you're doing, okay? You are still paying him more than his next best offer. If he had a better offer, he would have already sold it to somebody. Or he could call that guy tomorrow, right? So I have to assume that at this moment, I'm standing in his house, and I'm making him an offer. I have to assume that he might take it, okay? That's my feeling all the time, that... This is what I think it's going to cost to fix up this house. This is what I think this house... I looked at the... I will tell him, I looked at the comps before I left my office. So I know what this neighborhood sells for, right? And I don't want to hear his numbers because neighbors do this all the time. They go, oh, the guy down the street who sold his house for $320,000. No, you mean the guy down the street put his house up for $320,000, but it actually sold for two seventy-five. dollars all right? And so you, you're going to hear these stories all the time. Um, all right, let's keep moving. Don't fall in love with the deal, okay? I mean, fall in love with the deal, not the property. Now, if you're going to live in a property, you can forget this rule, okay? So this guy here is one of Larry's friends, and he's very excited about living in this house, okay? I don't have any problem with that. If you... Find the house you want to live in, okay? I don't care what you pay for it. I've had people at the gym come up to me and go, Hey, Phil, what do you think? I'm thinking about buying a $750,000 house in Warrington. You think I should buy it? I said, is it a house you're going to live in? If the answer is yes, well, what the hell are you asking me for? If you want to live in it, if that's your dream house, live in it. If you want to talk to me about investment property, I could analyze it a little better for you. But if you want to live in it, you should buy it. If you, this is the house you want. Don't ask me about it. There's actually a guy from my gym, LA Fitness, who asked me that very question. And I said something like exactly what I just said. Later on, after the crash of 2008, he came up to me and said, you should have never told me to buy that house. I'm like, what am I? You know, are you like a ventriloquist dummy sitting on my leg? <laughs> you asked me a question at the gym. I said, sure, if that's the house you want to live in, you should buy it, all right? So if you're going to live in a house, I have absolutely no issue. I don't care if you spend $2 million on it. Good for you. Have a blast, all right? Investment properties are different, though. You want to leave your emotions behind, okay? And you, you want to just look at this thing and figure out what you can rent it for. You can find out what rents are by going on the MLS and seeing what people in the neighborhood are renting it for. You can go on, uh, like, what is it, Rent-A-Meter is a website. You can look on, I'm not so sure, about how good their numbers are. 
Craigslist. I used to go and look and see what they would rent things for. So really, you're just trying to figure out, like, what does the area rent for? How much is it going to cost to fix up this house, right? Let's, <clears throat> you know, do the numbers work? That's all you really need to know. Is this thing going to kick off cash flow to me and how much, right? If you can find some businesses to buy, like a funeral parlor, I mean, I don't know. That's something you could, that would be cool. I'm sure you could sell that to somebody, right? right? Well, you could keep it if you want to. Yeah, you've got some, yeah, I know you're a little dark. I know you, you've got a list of people I think you're keeping tabs on. Is, is Larry on that list? Right. You don't want to, tell me later, after the meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, I used to have this guy who would uh, find houses. He was like a bird dog, okay? Carl. <laughs> Ramanita just wants to look at my flowing hair, and your head is like blocking her entire view. I'll stand over here. How's that? Is that better? All right. This guy used to, he used to be like a bird dog. Bird dog is just somebody who finds a deal and maybe wants me to pay him something for, for the finding the deal, right? Which I got no problem with. Except for one thing. Every time he went into a place, he'd go, he'd go, this place is disgusting. He goes, I can't believe people live like this. I can't believe people live like this. It's all he used to say all the time. I'm like, what the hell do you care? All right? You're not the one that you're, you're just going to get paid a couple of grand to, if I decide to buy this house. What do you care? Uh, it, it's funny the things that, that people say when they go in the house. Think about what you're going to say. Think about it before you go in there. All right? You don't want to insult these people. You want to get to the bottom of why are they selling their house. And usually they don't tell you the truth on the first time around. So one of the things that I do, if I ask them a question, like Luis, for example, was the seller, I might ask him a question about why are you selling your house? And he might say, oh, you know, I'm just uh, tired of this neighborhood. There's some, you know, the, 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 they're defunding the police and the cops aren't coming around here anymore and I don't really uh, feel safe here anymore. And I might believe that because that's happening today, but maybe... I'm just going to test them a little bit. So I'm going to talk about something else, and then I'm going to come back to them and, and ask them again, uh, has there been any specific things that really are making you think of selling? You know, like an incident maybe that happened on the street or something. I want to know too, because if I'm going to buy this house, I'm going to want have to deal with these problems as well. So you want to know a little bit about it. Okay, so number four. Never be the first to name a figure. Well, this is a tough one, because <clears throat> I like to get them to name the figure first, right? And usually, if you're the one naming the figure, you're, you're at a disadvantage, OK? Doesn't mean you're going to lose, but you're probably, it's, I'd rather them just throw out a number, right? Because they know. And, and one way you can tell that they know is because you'll ask them, and they'll say, I don't know what it's for. And then you're forced at some point to make them an offer. So you're going, you're going to have to make offers to people. So when I make an offer to them, all of a sudden now they want to argue with me. Because they apparently know all about what the neighborhood is selling for. So that's a, something that happens a lot. Well, say I have no idea what my home is worth. And then after you name a price, suddenly they're experts. And this rule can be used in a lot of circumstances, like buying cars or whatever. Uh, it's funny how people behave. For sale by owners, FISBO signs. If you see one of these signs, you absolutely, at a bare minimum, have to pull over and take a picture of that sign with the phone number legible on your picture. If I don't care if you're on your way to your wedding and you're late. Stop and take that picture. It will only take another minute. If you're 10 minutes late, so what? You're 11 minutes late. That's not going to kill your marriage. If it does, you probably shouldn't marry that person. All right? Taking pictures of Fizbo's. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. I saw a sign, and I'm like, hold on, i got to stop. I, I was in Anna Marie Island, and we were going up there to go to a fishing pier. I had all these people in my car. I'm driving, like, uh, a Tahoe, which can hold, like, eight people or something. 
I saw a FISBO sign. I pulled over. I ran across the street. I couldn't get the phone number from where I was parked, so I had to run onto their lawn and take a picture of it. And they're like, what the hell are you doing? You know, what, what do you think I'm doing? It's a FISBO sign. You know, that has to be responded to. You've got to, to do that. The tiny house park was bought by accident. There was a FISBO sign in front of this crappy little trailer, and it turned out the guy who answered the phone was, was Gallagher II, Gallagher's brother, the guy who smashed watermelons, and, and he said to me, no, I'm not selling the mobile home, I'm selling the entire park. And I was just like, cha-ching, jackpot, right? And like three days later, we had the property under contract, right? So these things can definitely happen. If you don't believe they're going to happen to you, it probably won't. If you do believe it will happen to you, it probably will. So if you see a FISBO sign, stop. Now, if you really got a lot of energy, you see a postman going around in a little, little truck, pull over next to the postman. I guarantee you, if you say to the postman, hey, do you know of any houses that I might be able to buy around here? Like maybe people who are in foreclosure, people are getting divorced, or any particular problems that have happened around here that, that maybe you know about? Trust me, the mailman knows everything. He knows every damn thing going on inside your house. And he may never have even spoken to you. But he knows if you're in foreclosure. He's seen the letters, okay? (laughs) He carries them to your house. He knows. If you're behind or if you're getting divorced or if somebody died and and there's going to be a probate situation, he knows. My neighbor passed away who I really didn't have a relationship with him, but he lived right behind me. He's kind of like unfriendly, so I was just like, whatever, I don't care. And uh, <clears throat> he, um, when he died, I heard about it from a friend of mine who I played poker with. He told me about it, and I simply just walked over to the house, and I hand wrote like a probate letter to stick it in his door. There was already like 27 letters over there, postcards and everything. Like there's a lot of people buy that list for probates, right? And, and they were all over it already, but uh, good for them. That's what, that's what pros should be doing, right? So let's keep going. All right, so be counter-cyclical. Uh, it takes a lot of fortitude to go against the grain, all right? So one example of this that I've done in my life is in 2012, I went down to Florida and started buying down there. And I, I started... Um, I, I went down there, and I just wanted to buy in Florida. I had gone to um, Siesta Key. I found Siesta Key for the first time by accident. So I was, I was up in Clearwater checking out a Phillies game. I went to Clearwater. I went to St. Pete. I saw a lot of vacant stores in that St. Pete area, and I was not impressed with what it looked like. And uh, maybe I was in a bad part of town because I, I, I haven't spent that much time in St. Pete even up to, to now. I haven't, but um, I had done a Google search of the worst hit real estate markets in 2012, and Las Vegas was number one. I didn't want to be flying out to Las Vegas all the time. Uh, I wanted to go to Florida. Well, uh, Cape Coral and Miami were on the list, along with Sarasota. I knew I didn't want to live in Miami it's more like a younger place, and that wasn't for me. I wanted to live more in a quieter family kind of place. So I thought that the West Coast might work for me. I'd never been to Sarasota, but I decided to go there. So uh, we, especially since I was in St. Pete, I wasn't that far away. So I went right down an hour south. Now I'm in Sarasota. I walk into this bar. Sure enough, I meet an Italian guy from Philadelphia. Who's a realtor? Yeah. What a coincidence that was, huh? And uh, his name was Steve Severino, right? And, you know, his typical Philadelphia guy putting the F word in every single sentence and telling me all about, like, the area and the whole bit. And I ended up hanging out in this bar with him for, like, eight hours. And uh, I had to carry my wife to the car. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, I was supposed to be at a wedding in Naples 
and I was supposed to be there for the, um, what, the rehearsal dinner, right? Well, I got there at like 12.30 <laughs> the, the next day, right? Like 12.30, I, after midnight. They didn't care. They were my cousins, and they didn't care, and everybody was happy. Just glad I got there alive. And um, <clears throat> I knew one thing about Naples. After driving around it the next day, I, I knew I didn't want nothing to do with that town. I started driving around Naples where they have the beach. And they got these gigantic hotels with 27-foot high walls. And you can't even see the beach. You can't see it anywhere, right? You just you drive up and down like this beach road. You can't see. All you see is the hotel name and a giant wall. And it's like, get the hell out of here. That's what it felt like to me. And I told my wife, I said, after this wedding, we're going back to Sarasota. Sarasota has a completely different feel. There are bars and restaurants and 6,000 car parking lots and wel everything is more welcoming and the people are cool and it's more, it's, it's not young people, but it's like a 35 to maybe 60 range and a, a neighborhood that made me feel very comfortable and very welcome and I could actually see the beach no matter where I went. You could see it and I felt much better about it there. So, <clears throat> you know, if we have another crash, which Larry has predicted, he says is coming, I'm probably going to go back to Florida and try to get some great deals. Now, I kind of need a house, like, pretty soon down there. Uh, but if, if I end up waiting a little longer, I might get a much better deal. I might get a... Maybe I'll have enough money to buy multiple properties down there, which would be cool. A good example of being counter-cyclical, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you read Dolph DeRusse's book. It's called The Real, Real Estate Riches. And, it, uh, and in 1980 in New Zealand, interest rates were as high as 27%. And Dolph had money, and he was smart enough to go out and buy some of these properties that nobody was bidding on because the interest rate was 27%, okay? And he just knew that that rate wasn't going to last forever. And about a year and a half later, the rates came down to uh, like 10%. And then it came down in a single digits after that. And this was a gutsy move that Dolph did to acquire a real estate portfolio while he was still in college. So if you read his book, it's pretty cool. It's about he made $35,000 on one real estate deal while he was still in college. And the job offer that he got for electrical engineering offered him 35000 for the year. And he said, what the hell am I going to do? Why would I take that job? I'll just go find some more real estate deals. Okay. Always try to buy with zero to little down. We talk about no money down deals here all the time. Subject to seller financing. If you're in front of a seller, don't you dare leave that appointment until you've asked that seller, do you have a mortgage? How much do you owe on this house? What is the interest rate? Are you current on the loan? Ask these questions. It's a, it's a potential free deal for you. If you just make the payments on their loans, it's a potential free deal. If, if you're scared of doing it, you got to practice it in a mirror or something. You need to learn how to do this. You got to ask these questions. If they tell you that the house is free and clear, you have to ask them about seller financing. Would you carry paper? Would you be willing to sell me this property if I made payments to you, right? These strategies, you have to ask these questions. You cannot go on an appointment and not do it, right? These are things that we do presentations on all the time and learning what to say in these appointments and making sure you ask these critical questions. It's really important. It's incredibly important. So, uh, you know, to Susie Orman and to Dave Ramsey, I like to pick on them as often as I can. <clears throat> Their philosophy of paying everything down, that's, you know, not exactly something I believe in. I am more of I would rather go around and buy a, another 25 houses if I can, um, by whichever means is possible, 
where whether it's private money or or hard money or bank loans or seller financing or subject to I don't care I just want to acquire good properties to cash flow so I can enjoy continuing not to work uh, for the rest of my life which I do work but I don't necessarily call what I do it's not a job I just do it when I I'm ready to do it, which is almost every day. Yeah. Okay. You build up a nice portfolio of a bunch of houses that have equity in them over time. What's over time? I don't know. Ten years, seven years, eight years. Ten years is a good number. Buy things and sit on them for ten years. I guarantee you you'll be able to refi those houses. Unless there was some kind of 2008 crash in the middle of all of it. You'll be able to do something with these houses. And you'll be able to take these houses that you buy today in the next 10 years, from today until the next 10 years, you could go out and buy yourself a tiny house park or some kind of Executech Suites, a multi-million dollar property. You could buy something like that. You just need to let a little time go by, let the properties develop some equity in them, and then put them all together in a package and start refining them or selling them, or whatever. Really, the smartest move would be to refi them, okay? You always want to try to buy with zero or little down. And it's a, it's a gutsy thing that you have to stand in someone's house and ask them about their loan and find out what's going on with it. They could very well be leveraged. Like, it could be a $250,000 house, and they owe $250,000 on it and they just missed a couple of payments, and they might be heading to a sheriff sale, and they might lose their house and get nothing for it, and you could maybe do something about that. So you have to have the guts to ask these questions. All right, <clears throat> this rule is one of the hardest. So I've sold a number of properties that I've owned. I wish I never sold any of them, but I had to at certain points. I, I, I went, I, I've, it's been over probably about 25 years now that I haven't had a job. And like Executech feeds me a lot of money. I have certain really well cash flowing properties that I own that I get, I get money from. The tiny house park, I've been getting $10,000 checks a month all through the winter months, which is pretty awesome. My wife sends me a $6,000 check every month from Executech, which is almost a not a, a, a not fail check. So right now I'm I'm I don't have a job, but I got 16 grand coming in, which is awfully nice. Uh, the winter money from the tiny house park won't last all year. It'll only last for the winter time, and then the middle of the, in the middle seasons, like uh, from May to say August, it'll pay me less. And then in September to December, it'll pay me almost nothing, okay? But all of these things are things that I've acquired an ownership in and are paying me, and I'm not necessarily doing anything. My business partner manages the tiny house park, and uh, he developed like a software program that he uses to manage the vacation rentals in Florida, and he gets paid a commission for that, and then I just get a check, okay? 10 grand in the winter, which is pretty nice. Pretty nice check. Okay, so what do you do? I mean, sometimes you're going to have to sell. Sometimes you're just going to have to. You know, the real estate business, it, it tends to be equity rich and a cash poor kind of a business. And at some point, you're going to get frustrated and just say, you know something? I want to open up my, I want to look in my bank account and see. $125,000 in there. I want to see that, right? And that usually requires you to sell a building in order to get that, okay? And <laughs> go back in your hole over there. Close the door. Right? So, you know, one of the things that can be done is you could refi the houses, which is a much smarter move. If you've given it 10 years for these houses to accumulate some equity there, you could go to a bank and say, 
hey, I've got these properties. Look at these properties. Larry just refied 13 properties. Now, of course, his properties were in, uh, what's the name of that town? Easton, Pennsylvania. It's kind of like half of a real town, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, that's where his properties are, you know. And he found a bank that refied all 13 of his properties in one shot. So uh, I don't think he got as much money as he wanted, but he got money. He got paid. And he didn't sell his property, so he still owns them. Now, now he's got like a second mortgage on 13 properties. So he's accumulating. He's it, 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 one way to think about it is he's like taxed his own portfolio. But I mean, I'm doing the same thing right now. I'm looking at Executech, and I'm going to probably pull a million bucks out and go do something with it. So this is a rule that we're all going to break someday. Just try to do it by refining things, if you can. If, if you hate the property and you, you know, I kind of think of it like this. A smart real estate deal, like take Executech Suites, for example. I love that real estate deal, okay? Because it keeps paying me money. I'm proud to own it. I hardly ever go there. My wife and my daughter run it. It's a perfect scenario for me. I just get a big fat check at the end of the month for six grand. I'm happy as can be. My wife gets paid a salary. My daughter gets paid a salary. They do all the work. And, and I just get this check. <laughs> it's a good deal for me, right? I don't, want to, I don't want to do anything to interrupt that process. I want to find more if I can. Okay, so let's talk uh, about these couple deals I was telling you about. The deal of a decade comes along often. You just got to be able to put them together, all right? So I want to tell you about a couple deals. One of them is 425 South Warminster Road. Would you put up a picture of that, please? Yeah, there she is. So this is a deal that I just, I just did. This house is in a major flood zone. I met these people at a gym wearing, I'm not wearing my I Buy Houses t-shirt tonight, but I was wearing my I Buy Houses t-shirt at the LA Fitness Gym, and I met this guy who says my mother-in-law is probably going to move into a nursing home in the next six months or so, and, uh, and we started talking at the gym about me buying his house. And he, this was back when I still had the Beamer out front, I would always try to park it in the front spots uh, right in front of the gym. So when people came into the gym, they'd see my car. When they came out of the gym, they'd see my car. And on the back trunk, it said, I buy houses with my phone number on it. So everyone sitting at the front desk could see it. And, you know, the, the whole front of LA Fitness Gym is all glass. So I ended up, he comes up to me in September of last year when Hurricane Ida came through. And this basement of this house flooded so bad that they said that when they opened the basement door, it was three inches away from flooding the main floor. But the basement was like a deep basement, like 12 feet deep or something, and it didn't come up to the main floor. And sometimes being lucky is better than being smart, right? So in this particular house, the, the water ultimately just all drained out they had uh, flood insurance, so they got a brand new water heater. They got a brand new heater. They replaced the back door to the basement, which was warped to holy hell. It was like had a 30-degree curve on the bottom of it. All those things got replaced. I did not fix a single thing in this house. I did not even turn a screwdriver uh, one circle around the little light switch screw. And I put this property up for sale on the MLS. I bought it off of these people. I went to meet them. I offered them 120 grand. The bidding process went back and forth. I ended up paying 165,000 for it. I had the cash. I just bought the house for cash. The reason I bought it for cash, I could have probably just wholesaled it, but the reason I bought it for cash is because I knew I was going to make a lot of money off this deal, and I didn't want anything to interfere with that. So I just put up my own money, bought the house, and then I turned around and took a bunch of pictures of the house and made a video of the house, put it up on the MLS for sale, and I sold it for 265000 
right? Without fixing anything. Freaking awesome, all right? Uh, it took six weeks, and they bought the house for two sixty-five minus the commission I had to pay to the realtor who brought the buyer. He got paid. I paid some closing costs. I made ninety thousand dollars off a deal I didn't even work on from a stupid sixteen-dollar T-shirt. Right? Is this a great business or what? All right, Mike, can you put up the next property? So this is 420, 4022 Township Line Road in Collegeville. And uh, I found this deal. This is the main house. And th see this front section with the, with the bricks, with the stones on it? The woman who lived here wanted some more square footage. So she built this addition on the front of the house, which I thought ruined the house. I was seriously concerned that the layout, the layout was crazy. So you, you could see where the front door is, but when you walk in the front door, you're now in a hallway. This hallway goes like over to that wall and then up the steps, which was really weird. The other hallway goes this way. And it, and it goes like to an in-law suite, and then you gotta go through two or three zigzags and you're in the kitchen. Really weird layout. I did not like the layout. Hey, there's the garage. Her husband bought this garage, spent $50,000 on this garage. And that, yeah, this, is, this garage is huge. This is uh, like a brand new poured slab. You could park like, 10 cars in here. I was going to try to turn this garage into a sober house. I was, my brain was running around like crazy trying to figure out what to do. And, um, but I was concerned about the layout of the house. And uh, my business partner at the time, uh, we, were, we were just doing wholesale deals. And he's like, this house is going to need like $150,000. I said, well, and he really didn't want to do all that renovations and neither did I. So um, I just decided to, to lowball the seller and see what she would say. So I offered her 260 grand. She wasn't happy. We had a series of conversations. I had to go to her house and another house that she was living in to meet with her sister-in-law who was going to help her with the decision. I showed her comps. I told her what was wrong with the house. I told her I was concerned about the layout. I went over every possible reason I could think of. And much to my surprise, she accepted my offer of 260 grand. I turned around. I, I spent a month cleaning up the house. There was a lot of trash, a lot of junk in the gar in the a lot of junk uh, in the garage, in the two-car garage that was attached to the house. There was a lot of junk inside the big uh, garage, the $50,000 garage that he built. It was like a flag lot, so it was kind of weird. It had like two and a half acres, but you, you come up this long driveway and then the property kind of expands in the back. And uh, make a long story short, I put the thing up on the MLS. I think I put it up for $395,000. So, and somebody came around and bought it for $410,000. And the crazy thing about this whole situation was the buyer says to me, I need the garage. First she tells me I need the garage because I have multiple Lamborghinis. I didn't really believe her, but whatever. Okay, I, I, I didn't really care, right? Then she later on tells me that I needed to buy this house because that garage is where I'm going to store all of my um, party materials, tables, tablecloths, chairs, things like that. So she apparently had a party business in the middle of COVID. Mm, I don't kind of believe that story either, right? <laughs> then the realtor tells me, we're, we're going to pay uh, part of the fee in cash. K 
came to settlement with a Neiman Marcus paper bag, like the kind they give you at a shopping mall. Fives, tens, twenties. It, it took me like four hours to count the money. <laughs> uh, it was crazy. Uh, deals of a lifetime. That's just two of them that I did. One of them, I, I, I just sold it, like, I don't know, was it, was it December, was it January, somewhere around there. And then the, uh, I bought it, like, in September of last year. The, this one here was, I don't know, a similar time frame. I, I don't remember the dates. I got to look up on the HUD. But uh, two massive deals that I just found I didn't even fix them. Didn't fix e either one of them. Like the, the, the Collegeville house, I did a lot of work cleaning it out, right? I just drove there every day. I, I was like, there's nothing else I could be doing that's more important than cleaning up this house so that somebody will buy it. And that's, I just kept going there every day until I felt that it looked good enough, looked well enough that somebody would buy it. And I was right, because somebody did. So these kind of things can happen to you but you got to be out there looking for them. And I'm sure if you look, even I don't care if you're looking at houses in Philadelphia where you're making five grand off of them in a wholesale deal, that's, that's how you get started in this business. And then these, these crazy deals of a lifetime will come later. They'll come to you. But if you're not in the game looking for deals all the time, I don't know how it's going to happen for you. So... Start doing it. Start doing some kind of marketing. Start calling people if you don't have any money. That's free. But there's your cell phone. You can make a thousand phone calls a day with your cell phone. No one's going to charge you for that, right? Right? You can do that forever, right? There are multiple deals of a lifetime out there. And you're running out of life. <laughs> so I like to say multiple deals of a lifetime and only half a life. You got to be out there hustling. Find some of these things and make some of it happen. And if you have to fix it up, you have to fix it up. Come to the school. We'll tell you where to get the money. We'll tell you how to solve the problem. You'll be able to do it. They don't have to be deals that don't get worked on at all. These are, these are just lucky deals. I'm lucky. Na 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 poo poo. What do you want me to say? I'm lucky. I've always been lucky. I don't know why somebody up there likes me. All right. So I hope that I've motivated some of you to start looking for one of these kind of deals. It is a freaking awesome feeling to make $90,000 off a house you didn't even work on. Okay? It's awesome. And I hope that you all experience that feeling soon.